and welcome to South Korea. I'm here in Seoul, that's Seoul behind me, uh, for Kyrec, Kyrec 2019, which is a conference all about renewable energy in Asia. It's basically all about renewable energy uptake in Asia, where we're at the moment and where we're going in the future. And with a heavy emphasis on how can we try and accelerate this renewable energy transition. Now you may well wonder, why am I at this conference? And the reason for that is REN21. REN21, by the way, is the Renewable Energy Network for the 21st century. It's a... well, hang on, I interviewed somebody who can explain this much better than I can. The idea of REN21 was to, to create a network, a multi-stakeholder network, bring everybody together, together with NGOs, the science and academia, and create a network, uh, a global network, on renewable energy policy. So it's a policy network. This is my hotel room, by the way. Um, it's pretty nice, really. Um, I mean, it's... Hotel rooms are the same basically everywhere. Something that is unique to this room, though, I've never had this in a hotel room before, is um, the throne. It, it's got a control panel. I ran Google Translate uh, over the buttons, and um, one of them translated to river. One of the ones up here translated to, like, limbs. Uh, um, I will now attempt one of the buttons. Oh no, that's not for me. This video is going to be a vlog about my experience here. This is the first time I've been to Korea. It's the furthest east I've ever been, actually. But more than that, I expended about 880 kilograms of carbon getting here, and so about the same amount getting back. And I am trying to fly as little as possible for the foreseeable future. And if I'm going to have flown here and expended all that carbon, I have to make it worth it. So whilst I'm here, as well as doing this vlog and sort of showing you about this conference, I'm going to be shooting some stuff for other videos. So I'm going to be interviewing some interesting people from a variety of countries. There's like a hundred different nationalities represented here from across the world, and that's going to go into future projects. I'm also going to be going out there into Seoul and looking specifically at the issue of renewable energy in Korea, because Korea is a really interesting case. When REN21 emailed me about this conference, the facts about Korean energy were what kind of won me over to actually coming and actually committing to flying here. And we'll learn about that later on in the video. I can't tell you everything right now. Okay, we're about to start the, the opening ceremony. Well, that was kind of amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> so that opening session was basically the same as at any big conference like this. I've been to a couple before, but this is definitely the biggest. You know, heavy hitters like the Korean energy minister um, and the mayor of Seoul, who both gave really interesting speeches, translated, um, on they're basically recognising that climate change was a massive issue and that they wanted to do something about it. However, there was also a really uh, powerful speech from a, a young activist um, who's taking part in school strikes, who's basically saying, yeah, it's all well and good you saying that, but you're not doing anything? He may as well have pointed at the Minister of Energy and said, yeah, you're not, what are you doing? But for me at least, and I'm sure for a lot of people in the room, the massive highlight was Ban Ki-moon was here. For those of you who don't know, Ban Ki-moon was the previous United uh, Nations Secretary General and was the person who pushed the Paris Agreement over the line. Basically a massive climate hero. And for me, when I was at school, he had just been elected Secretary General, I think in 2007, when I was doing a lot of model United Nations stuff. Um, so I was, you know, going to conferences around the UK and pretending to represent different countries and got quite good at it. He he was like the figurehead, he was Mr. UN, and especially with regards to the climate stuff, it was, it was just a massive privilege to see him in the room. It was, it was really, really cool. Initial observations on Korea, by the way. I like it here. People are very friendly, things are very clean, apart from the air. The air pollution's um, really quite shockingly bad. Something that I've noticed, by the way, is that I don't know if it's just this conference and every institution I've been at in this country so far, 
Koreans really seem to like jazzy hold music. Like between the sessions, I've never had an, I've never seen this at any academic conference before. There's just like kind of like saxophone, piano based light jazz between sessions. <laughs> It also happened on my bus from the airport, and I'm pretty sure in, like, well, the hotel, it kind of makes sense. I don't know, is that a Korean thing? Is jazzy hold music wherever possible just like a Korean thing? But following that, we're now going to come to the most important part of any conference. You know what's coming. Because of my flight times yesterday, I didn't actually eat at all. Like, I didn't have a single meal yesterday, so I'm making up for it. And I'm having to eat salmon. I am pescatarian, for those of you who keep asking. Um, I try not to eat fish wherever I can, but sometimes, like now, you just have to, because there's literally... I mean, I could just eat rice here, but that is the only vegetarian option here. Everything else is either meat or fish. <laughs> Cultural difference, I guess. So, post-lunch, just saw one of the most interesting plenary sessions I've ever seen. All talking about renewables being the new normal and the transition to 100% renewables for not just electricity generation but also for transport and for heating. And basically, how we can meet the Paris Agreement's um, targets of, by 2050, being net carbon zero. The session basically gave me a huge amount of hope that, you know, as was the case in Germany's energy industry, for example, it can be done, and it can be done very effectively, and it just, you know, a lot of them have left by now, now that I'm filming this, but there were so many important people in the energy industry from around the world who were able to see that discussion taking place, and see these people, these experts, saying, yeah, I'm optimistic that we, we can do this, I'm a stubborn optimist, it's going to be difficult, but I think we can do it right. I really hope they're right. <laughs> I think uh, technically, economically, 100% renewable future is possible, even probably before 2050. Um, it is uh, difficult because um, there is so much um, sort of interest um, driven energy policy, which is based on fossil and partly even nuclear fuels. Um, and that actually stops and holds the, the industry back. So technically, economically, no problem. Politically, Yes. No, um, not yet, but I think we'll get there because at the end of the day, politicians will also realize that renewables are simply cheaper. Well, if you've never been to a conference like this, they're bloody tiring, especially when you're jet lagged. So this afternoon there was the first of the breakout sessions. So instead of having like massive things in the big auditorium, which is up there, they were in these small rooms on this floor, which was much more specialized. So I was just in a session on how to make the renewable energy transition inclusive uh, in terms of gender and in terms of wealth. And that was an interesting session. There a bunch of interesting statistics on the fact that renewable energy is actually a lot more inclusive in terms of gender than um, traditional energy. Um, so if you look at like the distribution, the, the ratio of men to women, it's higher in renewables by quite some distance, um, but not 50-50. So some power structures kind of carry on. What's happening now is this is the first evening of the conference proper. There was kind of like a warm-up thing yesterday, but this is the first proper evening, and so there's going to be a cocktail reception which is being put on by the conference organisers for all the bigwigs. But also I get to go. If I could get used to this international diplomacy, right? Mm. I think this is what climate change deniers think that the um, academic climate change gravy train looks like. Um, not, not all events are like, I've never been to an academic conference even remotely like this, just, just so you know. You know, I was thinking to myself, Today couldn't get any stranger. We've had a massive international conference. Uh, got to see Ban Ki Moon. Uh, got to interview some really interesting people. Swanky dinner, cocktail party. And then the K pop group came out. <laughs> The K-pop group 
singing, of all things, an ABBA medley for an, an audience of international energy ministers who started dancing. I know that the jet lag is making me a bit woozy, but this, <laughs> this is weird, right? I feel like I'm in an Escher painting. I'm sure if I was being a political animal about this and I wanted to get to know people that I wanted to interview and maybe sway some people, I'd be in there still talking, but... I'm too tired, man. I don't do parties at the best of time, let alone when I'm jet lagged by eight hours. Right, day two. Because this is like a big deal, there's a bunch of press here and they've been covering the whole event with nice and I'm getting a bit insecure about my gear, I'm not gonna lie guys. Like, look at that camera. This guy knows what he's doing. This guy films. I'm just a guy with a DSLR and crippling social anxiety that means I can't talk to people. I'm just a guy I can't compete with the bros. <laughs> Let this be a lesson to you. If you've ever interned somewhere or done like work experience and you felt like you were a bit demeaned, like you weren't being used to your full potential, at least you are not. Literally being used as a microphone stand. Thank you, Kneeling Mic Man, for your service. This interview would be impossible. They definitely just couldn't get the delegate to hold the microphone. So now the conference is done, we're in 21 people can relax, so I'm joining them for a little uh, trip out into, I have no idea where, in Seoul, and we're going to go get some food. There's a very intense vibe in this room. We're not sure if we're actually allowed to eat this or not, but I mean, my gin down at the end, our uh, liaison is. is so we've got our like porridge. And everything, everything's wooden, including the, uh, the cutlery. Well, this is the same salad for everybody, right? And you can eat it without. Now it's only okay. Oh, you taste it much. <laughs> we don't even know what this food is, but it's T1000 doing when it comes to eating. I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. What does it taste like? Yeah. <laughs> jelly, jelly, hot jelly. <laughs> hot jelly. That's not a taste, that's a texture. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> the taste doesn't exist. Yeah, it's really. <laughs> <laughs> Even the stab no, doesn't work. Right. You are right. <laughs> my, my super weapon is useless. Yeah. How do you know? It's the one you, you go to if you have no other option. <laughs> <laughs> so I just multiply the problem. <laughs> they ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Okay, time to try soju. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. Uh... Ooh, that's dangerous. That's very dangerous. I won't lie, I am slightly regretting putting so much of this jelly on my plate. It's like, it's like, it's like eating water, exactly. Water, but shame on you, mystery lab food. <laughs> The other stuff's nice, like the aubergine things. Are it's, it's really good. There's patty cake. I haven't tried this yet. Oh. Have some before. oh, there's noodles as well. At least I think. Okay, so we're about 45 minutes into the meal, I think, at this point, and we have so many dishes in front of us. Right now, I have like this boiling soup, a tofu sandwich. I'm not even sure what this is. A fish, which I only have chopsticks to eat with. Rice mystery paste. Another mystery paste with, with some uh, with some. Leaves. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Oh no, oh no, oh no! 
Duncan is incredibly sure that this it's a is an otter. It's clearly... It, it's, it's an it's, otter. It's a beaver. It's really? I thought it was a bear. It's a bear. <laughs> it's definitely a bear. Did any, have, you, have any of you seen nature? <laughs> So dinner was interesting, um, like a million different dishes per person, it's a bit like kind of Korean tapas, I guess. And Wei Jin, uh, like a kind of, she, she works for Ren21, but she's also kind of acting as like a liaison. I uh, was saying that, you know, if you're cooking for more than a couple of people, that is how she would certainly present the food. So it was nice to kind of get like a sense of, <laughs> beyond just conference food, what like, what you know, what living in Korea is like. So that was cool. They also had cats, so 10 out of 10. We're currently being guided to a undisclosed new location tonight. Apparently we're north of the river um, in Seoul, and that's basically where it, it feels much more this is where people live like the south, south of the river where we were is a bit like the city in London it's like where a lot of the, the, the big finance like a lot of the big business and the wealth is concentrated but this is, around us is people's lives and it feels like oh this city at night is amazing it feels alive Oh my goodness, Spiffing Brit, if you're like, watching this. It's got a Brings a tear to the eye. So in the space of a single block, we've gone from one end of the, the soul spectrum and like the most neon I think I've ever seen in my life in one place. And then literally just like two minutes down the road, there's this beautiful little bit of nature right in the middle of the city. It's quite <laughs> eerie how, yeah, how much ambient light there is. <laughs> I mean, it feels like there's a massive sports stadium yeah. in every direction. Oh wow, there's like art oh, under the bridge and everything. Oh, this is so pretty! As much as we've been enjoying this nature walk down here, we've just been talking about how the light pollution here, I don't know if you can tell, but like, it's like half ten at night. It, it, it should be pitch black, but because there's just so many lights and there's so many, you know, massive lights on the tops of buildings and the city is just so big that it's never going to get any darker than this. I mean, like, good luck ever trying to see the stars. And admittedly, tonight is particularly bad because there's a bunch of low cloud, but it's just... Uh, never seen anything like it. Not, even, not in the centre of London, not in all the big cities I've been to. It's quite extraordinary. It's predicted by the end of the century that um, I think it's 80% of uh, the human population is going to be in cities. But is that the night sky that 80% of people are going to see? <laughs> We're trying to find somewhere to get a drink, I think. It's an absolute jungle down here. <laughs> Oh, no, that's better. <laughs> so Korean builds are almost entirely geared towards science, but um, you can spec into domination uh, if, if you want. So this is technically the last day of the conference. This is the, um, the cultural tour that's been organized by uh, the conference conveners. Um, and we're coming here, we're going to two other places. So this is a, a fortress, um, sort of south of Seoul proper. Um, it was built around 1800. Interesting for a variety of reasons, we just had a really interesting tour and sort of shown around some of the fortifications. Um, one of the interesting things was about 70% of, of the fortress that you can see behind me was destroyed in the Korean War. Um, but the records when it was built in the first place were so meticulous, they were able to recreate exactly what it was. To the point where now it's the UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is as good as a recreation as you could ever sort of hope for. Compared to European fortresses, from, well, I suppose at the, the 
at this time it was Napoleonic, so certainly compared to um, those fortresses, it's amazingly like richly decorated. It's, it's, it's beautiful here. Look at this. It's a gatehouse. Who decorates a gatehouse like this? The other thing our tour guide pointed out was that uh, it works out on average that Korea uh, has had a war in its sort of recorded history on average once every six months. <laughs> like, these people are really, really bloody sick of warfare. In case you're wondering why the walls are so low, by the way, they're like five meters tall. Um, it's because this is uh, what to lo us looks like a, when I say us, I mean like Europeans, it looks like a medieval fortress, but this was built in an age of cannon. So having tall walls is like no advantage. It's just a bigger target. So after the fortress, we've come to a temple. I'll be very real with you. I don't really understand what's going on. No one's really explained very much to me apart from the fact that this is a temple and it's very pretty, look. There's a lot of dynastic stuff here, look. This is the sort of central, um, what's it called, audience chamber. Um, and the, the whole, the family that built all this has got, like, had some, uh, had some murder in it. I'll be, I really, I, I, I've been listening to the tour guide, I still don't really understand what's happening. Right, so I actually paid attention for a bit, and <laughs> we finally cracked the code of why there are so many side dishes yesterday when we had that big meal. It's because all the dishes have, um, like in Korea society, energy balance, and there's like five different kinds of energy is really important. Each dish has an associated energy, and so it's like trying to balance everything. It's like trying to construct a balanced Pokemon deck. Well done, Simon. That's a reference from 1997. One more stop on the tour, and it's a traditional uh, village in the middle of Seoul. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> The general sense I've had of being here, like now that we've gone a bit further abroad than just the convention center, is that it kind of confirms what I thought before, which was that everyone here is really polite. There's like respect is a massive, um, respect, and particularly respect for, for elders is like a massive thing here. People are a lot more measured, I guess. It's also meticulously clean. I mean, obviously this is like a tourist tra place, so you'd expect it to be clean, but I don't think I've seen a single piece of litter or a single piece of graffiti the entire time that I've been here. I've got to say, I like it a lot. I, 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 it's a shame, I just wish Pixel Girl could be here with me because she, I'm sure, find all of this really interesting. And it's, obviously there are people at the convention with me, but like, it's much, it's much more fun when you're traveling with other people, I think, people that you love. I mean, when it's like this, it's, it could be worse, <laughs> come on. I have no idea if this is gonna make it into the vlog or not, but, I'm really stressed out. I, just, I have no idea what I'm supposed to buy people as, as presents, as souvenirs, because it's all it's all for kids or it's all tat. It's all tat. All really expensive. I struggle buying presents for people at the best of times, but like I'm now trying to do it in a language where I can't even read the labels. I don't even know what half of the stuff is. Even if I could read the labels, I'm pretty sure I still wouldn't know what half this stuff is. Okay, so we're now having a look around the actual historical village, which is a bit more what I expected, this kind of thing. It's amazing how cultures all over the world have come up with basically the same punishment. Same, 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 same. Get yeah. Yeah. Lots of spiky things. <laughs> this is not at all creepy.
Well, that's pretty cool. Another observation about Korea, I have never been anywhere where people have been so willing to duck under the camera. Whenever I have been filming here, and also at the conference, everybody, like, instead of getting in the way, has just ducked under the frame. Like, without me asking to, everyone's just been like, Whoa. Very helpful, easiest country to film in I've ever been to. This village is amazing, by the way. It's, it's just so fundamentally different. It's like, when, when it, if I'm in England and I go to, like, a traditional village, like, and, and there's thatch huts and something from like the 16th century or something like that. Um, you can still relate to it on some level because it's only different in some ways. Here, the like the the real fundamentals, like for example the alphabet, um, like the materials used, like the philosophy that's gone into all the buildings. Everything is just so different. It's like it's kind of overwhelming how completely different. How, how I don't want to use the word alien because that has negative connotations. I think it's really interesting and like I'd love to learn more. We we have like five minutes here. Um, it's just so different. It's, it's this is amazing. I'm kind of tempted to come back to Korea now and actually have more time here with Pixel. Thank you very much to the um, the conference team for setting this up. This has been a real highlight. Ooh. Hello, ladies. So it's the final day here. Sunday, I'm flying out tonight. So I thought I'd do something that I've not had an opportunity to do this whole time. So I've been starting so early. Go for a run. And just uh, having a look around this temple complex that you can see from the uh, convention center. I just wanted to see it for myself. <laughs> Definitely the most interesting morning run I've ever done. It's an amazing sight for a temple. You know, all this traditional work and then one of the most modern cities in the world. It's beautiful. Well, I made it to the Han River. This is the big river that bisects Seoul. It's really significant in Korean culture because it sort of represents the economic miracle of the last century. A miracle on the Han River. I think the miracle here is me reaching it and not dying because of all the hills. God damn. Oh. You can really see the air pollution this morning. Like, that's a lot of smog. It doesn't feel bad in the lungs, you can just see it. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. Right, I'm gonna run over the river and then back. See you in a bit. <sighs> okay, so I didn't know this was here, but I just ran over the bridge, this big thing, and I was gonna just turn around and go back, but uh, behind me was a public gym, so you know, hold in Rome, do bench press. Apparently, one of the exercises here is run like a Minecraft character. This is also the first bit of green I've seen in the city, so I'm just going to take the opportunity to run through it. It's very pretty. Oh man. How pretty is this? Oh, hello. Good morning. Alright, time to go. In the subway, almost all of the advertisements are for K-pop. And what's interesting is a lot of them, there's one down there, there's one here. These, these aren't part of the advert, these are post-it notes that people have put up here. This is like... Huge. 